the Medal of Honor from the United States government. Um, he claims to have killed over 4,000 buffalo, but basically he's known today as uh, the ultimate showman. I guess with P.T. Barnum, uh, the two of them were really the ultimate showman of their era. And basically what happened in 1882 in North Platte, Nebraska, where uh, uh, Cody had his farm, um, his, the, the townspeople came to him and said, hey, would you do a celebration for the 4th of July? So he kind of brought together some Native American friends as well as some uh, uh, cowboys, if you will, uh, and uh, they held what was probably the first rodeo in the American West. And it was such a huge hit, he did it again the next year, and that was such a huge hit that Bill decides to take it on the road. And basically he would develop his uh, Wild West show, it would tour for about 40 years, he ended just uh, about the time of the, of the First World War in the 20th century. He would make uh, um, trips to, uh, to Europe uh, and so forth. And the Wild West show is really one of the prominent uh, 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 showcasing of, of that American West. He said he was a friend to the, uh, to the Indian, uh, and, he, and he certainly was in many respects. What was important, though, is Bill paid his Native American performers fairly well. And so what his show offered to uh, many Native Americans, like Albert, was a means to escape poverty, a, a way to go out and earn money and send money back home to the reservation for his family. Uh, so it, it was an economic opportunity. And uh, they had to take advantage of it. I, I, I think of my uh, uh, you know, immediate family history. My uh, immigrant grandfather came here uh, from the southern Italy, which was very depressed at the time economically, and they were in poverty. But he saw America as a place to come and, um, you know, uh, hopefully gain some economic uh, benefit that would allow him and his family to continue. Well, it's kind of the same thing in many respects. In this case, my grandfather used to send money back home when he made it here. Well, it was the same with, with uh, Native Americans like Albert. This was a means for them to make money uh, to help with the poverty. Uh, that was going on uh, on the reservation. Um, and Bill uh, very much liked to have Lakota Sioux uh, uh, as performers. So we know he joins, Albert joins the Wild West show. Uh, he becomes one of the performers. We know he joined sometime in 1898 uh, and would tour for about two years with, with Buffalo Bill. But in 1900, they do a six week tour of New England. And when they do that tour, well, they come to Hartford, Connecticut on June 25th, 1900, and something happens there where many of the performers come down with food poisoning. When you read the old newspaper accounts, they refer to a bad can of corn. But clearly, it was different degrees of botulism. And by the time, so much so, the next day when they got to New Haven, um, you know, they were, uh, many of the performers were sick, almost 50 of them, so much so that they could hardly put on a show. They, they had like an abbreviated show because there were so many ill. And of course, the show must go on. It was a tough life. I mean, they were jumping on trains, performing next day. They jump on a train. By morning, they're at the next town, and they're performing again. Well, on the 28th, they hit Danbury, uh, Connecticut. Uh, and while most of the performers were now starting to overcome this, by the time they got to Danbury, Albert was uh, deathly sick. Um, um, Buffalo Bill's, uh, uh, one of Buffalo Bill's managers, Johnny Baker, uh, goes in to check to see how uh, the Native Americans are doing uh, with this case of food poisoning, and that's when you see that Albert is really very, very sick. He calls in uh, many of the Lakota that were there, uh, saying that we need, he's got to see a white man's doctor. It's the only way we can save him. A doctor, they approve, the doctor comes in, the doctor says there's nothing we can do for him, we've got to get him to the hospital. And so it is agreed that uh, among the tribe's members that uh, Albert would be allowed to go to the hospital. But Albert knows he's dying. In fact, one of the accounts is, is just that as he's leaving in a wagon going to Danbury Hospital, he tells everyone, uh, his fellow tribesmen, that he is going to die. He knows he's going to die. And he does. Uh, the next day uh, in Danbury Hospital, he will pass away uh, from, from botulism. And you know, we got you should hopefully appreciate that in our day and age, we have these wonderful medical technology and antibiotics um, uh, that help us deal with infections and so forth. Well, back then in 1900, there were no such things. And 
People often die of infections that we think nothing of anymore or we can handle. You can have an abscess tooth get infected and get it into your bloodstream and die. Yeah. So um, I don't think we appreciate how many people like this died of various kinds of poisons and you know, botulism and so forth. And unfortunately, Albert was, was one of those. When he dies, um, you know, it's a bu uh, Buffalo Bill says, spare no expense. And uh, the, the show would buy a, a burial plot and a casket uh, for Albert. And, and he would be buried at Worcester Street, uh, excuse me, Worcester Cemetery. Um, and um, basically in an unmarked grave. Uh, there was no real, um, um, it was thought that they would put a marker later on. But the show moved on. They were going to Pitts. Massachusetts and Albert gets left behind in his grave. The grave never gets marked and literally becomes lost and forgotten um, uh, in Worcester Cemetery. If you've never been to Worcester Cemetery, it's right in the heart of Danbury and really one of the most, really a beautiful, beautiful cemetery. Many prominent people are buried there, but it's really just a gorgeous cemetery, very large cemetery. There's wonderful trails and roads to go through. And yet, uh, it, here's where Albert laid for a hundred, over 100 years until Bob Young, who again is with us today, uh, discovers uh, the documentation of where he's buried. Bob uh, was a former employee at Worcester Cemetery. And today, he's uh, president uh, of the Danbury Museum and Historical Society. He, he had heard, uh, and he could tell you better uh, later, uh, but he had heard about this. Uh, Native American who dies in the city and is buried in the cemetery and gets curious, and as most historians are, I suppose, and uh, decides to do a search. He not only finds a burial card um, showing the plot number and everything of where Albert uh, was buried, but he does some more work and he finds Albert in the 1898 Indian census for Pine Ridge Reservation that he's living uh, with his grandfather next door to his, his uh, grandparents. And he finds out that there are afraid of hawks still living uh, on the reservation in South Dakota. Um, he would eventually contact them uh, and actually go out there. This is the card that Bob found. And you can see it, 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 it gives the, the lot number, the section, and so forth. Um, and we were able to go out in that area of the cemetery and plot where Bob had found him. Well. Um, Actually, there's a hiatus of about two years where uh, he doesn't hear from the family um, about his, after he notifies them of his discovery of Alfred's grave. And then they get back to him. But what has happened in the, in the interim is that Marlis Afraid of Hawk, who you see here with her father, Richard, uh, Daniel, uh, Marlis has a dream. And in her dream, uh, a young man uh, comes out of the clouds uh, riding on a horse in traditional uh, 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 regalia. His, uh, um, he's got long hair. He comes riding toward her. And he gets off the horse, and he plays a flute. She's only a young child during the dream, her dream. But his face is hidden, and she doesn't know who he is. He plays his flute, and then he motions for her to follow him. And he gets back on his horse, goes back into the clouds. And then out of the clouds came warriors and family members who now followed him and went away. And she said she wasn't afraid, um, uh, but she didn't understand what was going on. And so um, eventually she would go into council with the elders of the tribe, who, and, and as she explained her dream, um, you know, they basically <coughs> told her, it's, it's Albert coming to you and telling you he wants to come home. And at that point, she, it all came together for her. Um, and, uh, and her dream uh, made it her responsibility. And it's then that she got back in touch with Bob and started the repatriation process to actually have Albert's remains uh, brought back to South Dakota. And those of you that are obviously members of the Institute here and have uh, know of Native American cultures, you, you know that unlike in our culture, uh, dreams are dreams to us, you know, we make them Freudian, you know, whatever we want to do, psychoanalytic. <laughs> but to, to, to Native Americans, dreams are extremely powerful because dreams are a way in which uh, the spiritual life, uh, the spiritual world advises us, uh, gives us messages here in the natural world. And uh, as a result, dreams are spiritual uh, and dreams have meaning. Uh, and so, Marlis's dream is taken very seriously. It has meaning, and in this case, it, the meaning is 
that she uh, is to bring uh, Albert Afraid of Hawk home. And I introduce Wendell uh, to you. Wendell, uh, as a tribesman, uh, took on the responsibility of making sure that at the burial site and the work that we did uh, was uh, done with all rituals of uh, the Lakota Sioux. Uh, so he was their liaison, and whenever their family it turned out wasn't there, Wendell was there to see uh, of the purification uh, of, of the work and the recovery. Uh, also very important was Tanya Porta. Uh, Tanya is with the Cornell Memorial Hall. She was in charge with, uh, um, uh, by the family to supervise the disinterment and making sure the uh, Albert's remains were transported properly to the Pine Ridge. So she's uh, another very important person within this story. So we went to the cemetery, and this is actually, as we got going, we, we had three tents. Uh, the, the, the center tent it was over the gravesite itself, where we, where we started the work. So with everything in line, uh, we went to uh, Worcester Cemetery. You can see uh, uh, the modern Danbury Hospital in the background, and this is where Albert uh, died uh, in June of 1900, and would be buried on this slope. There are a number of tombstones there now, but the area where Albert was and a number of other people remained unmarked. And then as we got there to start the work, I hadn't known uh, this was going to happen. We had been working with Wendell and, uh, and, 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 and Bob and Tanya, uh, but a great surprise, and that was that Marlis and uh, family were able to travel from uh, South Dakota to Connecticut to be a part of this. And what happened was basically the, the tribal, tribal members uh, on the reservation raised money uh, to support their uh, ability to come here. So we were quite surprised because Marlis uh, was here. You can see her coming to the site uh, with her father, Daniel. Uh, and then some of the uh, Native Americans that were there, this was, I think, I believe on the first day, um, uh, uh, Wendell and his wife, Nancy, of course, Bob in the background, um, uh, Daniel, Marlis, John, afraid of Hawk, and Richard, Red Elk, and some of you may recognize Ed Sarabia, who is uh, the Indian Affairs Coordinator for the state of Connecticut, um, a dear friend, uh, and a um, member of the trustees here, right? Is he still mm -hmm. on the trustees? Uh, for the Institute. Um, so it started with opening ceremony, uh, and certainly with the medicine wheel, which represents the sac sacred uh, circle of life, um, and of course with Tatanka, the buffalo, uh, always. Uh, um, the buffalo symbol or skull is present in all sacred Lakota rituals, so uh, certainly a part of this as a, a, a sacred ritual. And of course the banner of the tribe, the Cheyenne River Sioux. There's John. John kept the sage and the sweet grass burning uh, throughout the entire day he was there. Uh, Wendell would do that when, once the family left, but John oversaw most of uh, making sure that the sweet grass and the sage uh, was always present uh, during the excavations. And then there was Daniel, and uh, you know, Daniel became everybody's uh, uh, grandfather, if, if you will. Um, he is actually the, the nephew <coughs> of Albert, afraid of Hawk. Um, he always, whenever he talked about Albert, he always referred to him as my grandfather. And of course, that would be proper in terms of Lakota kinship. Uh, and he is the son of Richard, afraid of Hawk, the survivor of Daniel would tell stories uh, of, the, of the family um, uh, while he was out there, and he would lead uh, uh, all of the ceremonies. Just a wonderful, sweet man, and uh, um, became everybody's grandfather. <laughs> well, we started, and uh, you know, based on Bob's research, we went out there and spray painted the grass, because you can see there's no tombstones here, um, where we believe uh, the burial would be, based on the, the record. Um, and we knew this would be uh, a burial where, of course, uh, we can anticipate the grave at, at anywhere between four and six feet. Uh, so what we did is we mechanically stripped the area where, um, where we believed it to be. What we basically did using the backhoe, a small backhoe with a blade, not with teeth, uh, to, to give a good cut. But what we did is really we went down two feet. And we stopped, we leveled it off. And at that point, we went down four inches at a time. Um, 
uh, in anticipation of, we're not sure what the exact depth is. But one of the things we did is we worked to uh, uh, clean the soils. So what we can look for is what archaeologists call features, and feature stain of the actual burial shaft. And you could, uh, and I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. And then what we did with each level, we came in with a metal detector and started to scan. We knew he had gotten a coffin here in 1900, uh, so we could anticipate hardware nails and other kind of uh, turnouts. He would have handles and so forth. But the idea is that the, the metal detector can penetrate a good foot into the ground and give us a, an idea of when we were getting closer. We got no pings, we went down another four inches. No pings, another four inches. Actually, it was about four feet when we started to get rings that were associated. And then we switched to hand tools at that point. Uh, but you can see the features staying here very clearly. Uh, this is just a change in the soil coloration. And what that is, is that, you know, you dig a hole, you go down four or six feet, whatever it is, you cut.